You're listening to Now I've Heard Everything, conversations with the icons of our time. I really love fiction. I'm really blessed because it's what I wanted to do when I was four years old. I told people I would be a writer when I grew up, and I intended it for it to be fiction. You know, journalism was an accident that I sort of happily fell into. Crime reporter turned mystery writer Edna Buchanan today on Now I've Heard Everything. I'm Bill Thompson. Edna Buchanan joined the Miami Herald in 1973, covering the police beat. And it turns out she was really good at it. By 1986, she'd won the Pulitzer Prize for her reporting. But by the late 1980s, she turned to fiction writing. Many of the real-life stories she had written about for the newspaper turned into raw material for her mysteries. And it turns out she was really good at those, too. Many of her books became bestsellers. A couple of them became movies. But she also continued to write nonfiction, and in 1992, she wrote a nonfiction book called Never Let Them See You Cry. And that's when she and I had one of our several conversations over the years. So here now, from 1992, Edna Buchanan. Does the success of your book surprise you in any way? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, you send them out like children into the world and hope that they're well-received. And of course, you've been working on them so long that you never know. You can't see the forest for the trees. You don't know if it's good, bad, or indifferent, and you just send them out there into the world and hope that, like children, that they'll be well-received and maybe perhaps someday send back some money. <laughs> <laughs> or at least not come home with some strange person and say, this is what right. I'm getting married to. Uh, <laughs> after the thousands and thousands of stories that you've collected in your head and the, and the many hundreds of them that you've told back to us in the form of your books, do you not get... How do you guard against getting bored with a particular story, taking a particular type, kind of story for granted? You think, oh, how yeah, it's another murder. Well, I think over the years, you know, they say that you would become calloused, but you don't. Over the years, I've become more sensitive, if anything. You can't grow calluses on your heart. And I think I've become more uh, linked and connected to the victims because I know something that they don't, that they're probably going to be victimized again by the system. And, and you don't forget these people. You can't. And uh, people say, don't you get tired of covering the same old drug murder 1,500 times? But it never is. If you go, if you look beneath the surface and you really ask questions, each case is different. The human story is different. So you can never get bored. And the joy of the job is that you can't accomplish things. You can become a victim's best friend. Do, does it, does it be, become wearying after a while? Do you get tired of the calls at all hours of the day and night to saying, hey, guess what I've got for you? Yeah, you do get tired. I know in, in 81, the year that we broke all the records for homicide, we had more than 600 murders, and I covered every one of them. It was like being caught up in a whirlwind, something that you couldn't control or stop, and I have no recollection of my personal life that year. I, I think I didn't have any. I just went from murder scene to murder scene to murder scene, but I had this obsession that I wanted each one to be covered. I felt the newspaper of record should cover them, and my editors kept saying, wait a minute, just cover the major murder of the day, and of course... I understood what they were saying, but argued the point and pretended that I didn't understand, because how can you cover the major murder of the day? I mean, every murder is major to the victim, and they all wanted to live as much as you or I, and they all deserve to be covered. And I did get them all in the paper, one way or the other, by hook or crook. How is it, though, that some murders wind up, I mean, you've seen them, maybe you've written some that wind up, page one, the victim's picture, his mother's picture, this picture of the where he went to school, you know, three, you know, four, five, six columns, a jump line, you know, more pictures. And others get mentioned on page A46, a little paragraph down toward the bottom. Right. Well, that's the editor's decision. And, of course, the editors decide how newsworthy a story is. Uh, I try to give the same kind of energy and coverage to every single one because I think it dehumanizes us to make these people statistics. I mean, that is one of the things that's really wrong with the system. There's the perpetrator, the, the, the defendant in court, you know, and the judge and the jury sort of identify with this living, breathing person who can usually shed a tear at the right moment. And the victim is nothing but a name or a number on a piece of paper, and they're often, so often forgotten. Maybe that's why it's so striking when we see the, the, the family of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims uh, coming screaming at him across the courtroom because that's a scene we've never seen before. Right. I think somebody always should speak for the victims. Uh, if it's not family, then it should be a reporter. It always infuriates me to see stories 
about men on death row, especially when they're seeking mercy and it's the defense. And you see a story about someone on death row and not a single line about their victim, who the victim was, how they died, what happened to them. And every time I ever wrote a story about anyone on death row, I always included up high at least a paragraph about the victim who might have been an 11 year old girl who was raped and murdered and strangled and you know because it's so unfair not to mention them you know they shouldn't be forgotten and I guess that's why murder always intrigues me the most because it's the one crime where the victim no longer has a voice and someone else has to speak for them they can't join any victims advocacy group they can't come to court they can't testify they can't protest they're not there but you you have to guard against the oh getting too emotionally wrapped up in this. If if to use your analogy, you don't build up calluses in your heart, neither can your heart take too many bullet holes, can it? Well, I guess it's it's because you feel like you you're on a mission. It's a cause, and what's such a joy about this job is the fact that life is so frustrating today. There's so much bureaucracy, so much red tape. Uh, social agencies don't respond. I mean, did you ever try to call up Social Security? You know, any of the, in the voice of the days of voicemail, you don't reach a human. And it's so frustrating, and journalists are among the few people left in the world who can really accomplish something because a story in the newspaper gets results. It can cut through red tape like a razor, and you can be a victim's best friend. What, among the stories that you give us in, in your new book, uh, were some more fun to write than others, were some more gratifying to write than others? I think the ones that have results, the one uh, where this young woman who grew up in Long Island uh, was adopted and wanted to find her adoptive, her true parents. And of course it turned out to be tragic. Her mother had been murdered at age 26 or something in Miami. And uh, it was a terrible murder by one of uh, Miami's most heinous killers. And it was a brutal discovery for her, but we found that she had brothers. And through the help of the readers and the story in the newspaper, we found this brother that she never knew she had, and they were reunited, and it was great. Those are the kinds of stories you love to write, the ones that produce results. Is it sad that though that those are the kind of stories that don't often make it out of Miami, except in a book like yours? What we hear from Miami is, oh, gee, you think the murder rate in Washington's bad? You ought to see it down in Miami. Oh, gee, all those people down there, the drugs and the mob violence, oh, you don't want to go to Miami. Yeah, there's a lot more to Miami than that, and I think we often uh, get a bad rap when it comes to that, because I think that uh, naturally there's a dark underbelly to every city, but Miami is no worse than any other, and I always think that we get a bad rap on the statistics because that's done per capita, per 100,000 population, you know, so many murders. That's how the FBI compiles the statistics. And nobody ever really knows how many people there are in Miami. They go by the census count. And of course, that's our population is swollen, probably doubled by the tourists every year. And then, of course, we have the uncounted tens of thousands illegal aliens. So probably at any given time, our population is, is twice what the figures show. And so that would, might mean that our murder rate is half what the figures show. Well, that's, that could be a good argument here. we got a lot of tourists in D.C., <laughs> too. <laughs> Maybe we should propose that to the, to the city powers that be. Uh, I know, having talked with emergency room doctors, they all have their own particular kind of case they really dislike seeing. You know, maybe, it's, maybe it's a particular kind of wound that they just they, they get, oh, they, they shudder at the thought of having to face that. Are there certain kinds of crimes that you just shudder at having to face, that you can handle anything else with ease, look at look at dead bodies, all, you know, it doesn't bother you, but there's a certain kind of crime that you don't, you just don't like to have to see it at all? Well, of course, there are crimes involving children and, and animals. I have a soft spot for animals. I'm an animal lover. And also, whenever the police get in trouble, it's tough because they get mad as hell and, and it's a terrible battle wrestling the facts away from them and they, you know, sort of uh, circle the wagons and pull up the drawbridges and give you a hard time, but you have to fight it out. A lot of reporters who cover a, pe a beat, when someone that they deal with every day on the beat gets in trouble, they'll have some other reporter to come in and do it. You know, the good guy, bad guy thing, so they don't burn their sources and lose them. But I always wanted to do it myself and always have, and just tell them, look, it's better if I do it than someone else because I care. You know, uh, I'll be fair, you'll get to tell your side, and it's much better if I do it than if some other reporter who doesn't know you does it.
Well, as well known as you are by now and as well respected as you are by now, I don't imagine you have as many barriers as other reporters do, do you? Uh, sure. It's tough because we've had a lot of police corruption. Uh, we've had, uh, over the last couple of years, at least 30 Miami police officers get into really serious trouble uh, being accused, arrested, convicted, in many cases, of narcotics trafficking robbery and murder, you know, drug murders. The police were doing drug murders. And in fact, one of our Miami policemen is still on the F FBI's 10 most wanted list. And he's been on it for a couple of years now. And so when that kind of stuff happens, uh, it's pretty tough to deal with the police department on an everyday basis. But you do it well. Well, I'm on leave of absence right now to write <laughs> books. So, uh, now, how you know, does that agree with you? Uh, I miss the stimulation of the newsroom, but it's wonderful. I love writing these nonfiction books because uh, I wrote about most of these people for the newspaper, but it's there, but it's not there. If anybody wants to go find it, they've got to look on microfiche, and it's not easy. But putting their adventures and their noble deeds, there's a lot of stories about heroes in this book, putting that between hardcovers of, of a book is, in a way, making them immortal. And I love that. It means a great deal to me. Those books will be on bookshelves and in libraries long after we're gone. And that means a great deal to me, more than I thought it would. It never even occurred to me when I first started to write these books. And of course now, I'm writing fiction. I, I wrote a novel a couple of years uh -huh. ago, and my next novel will be released in September. And it's the first in a series. And I love to write fiction because it was unexpectedly satisfying because as writers, we like to be tidy, we like to wrap up all the loose ends, solve all the perplexing mysteries, and in real life, in journalism, as you know, that doesn't happen. You know, there are murders that go un unsolved forever, corpses that are never identified, no matter how hard you try, missing people who are never found and who haunt you forever. And in fiction, the writer is in the driver's seat. You can wrap up all those loose ends, solve all the mysteries, and best of all, in the end, you can make the bad guys get what they deserve and have the good guys win, which almost never happens in real life. Is there any pressure, though, in fiction to, to come up with something as bizarre as the real stuff that you cover? That's an interesting observation because in Miami, uh, it's tough to write fiction because it's a city where truth is stranger. It really is. <laughs> you, yes, this is not your ordinary, uh, you know, and then we went and had a donut, and then we went and uh, did this uh, type book. There's a lot of very unusual personalities in here. Yeah, yeah. It's never boring in Miami. It's a great <laughs> place to be a writer. You know, it's just, uh, we've got all these people there. Because you look at Miami and it's way down there at the bottom of the map, sort of the jumping off place to nowhere. And even in the years when I first got there, when it was a sleepy resort city, what crime we did have was often quite bizarre. Because you had all these people who were on the run from their own personal demons, from uh, the law, from other people, and they'd be on the run and eventually get to Miami, the last stop. And they'd, of course, bring their personal demons with them. And then, of course, we began to have the great influx from the South, people on the run from dictators and war and poverty. And they would all get to Miami, and they'd all sort of come head to head. And the full moon would come out, and the barometric pressure would drop, and things would go crazy. And I love it. I mean, there's no place like Miami. <laughs> Is there any particular quality that a Miami cop must have that maybe a Chicago or a Boston or a Washington cop doesn't necessarily need? Well, for one thing, uh, pretty much now they've got to be bilingual. Uh, I've gone to scenes in Miami where I would jump out of the car and two or three police officers would come running toward me because they wouldn't know at first who I was or, or they didn't want me to park there or something. And they'd all be yelling in Spanish. I mean, it's the first language for many of them. It's almost like being in a, a foreign capital. And um, we have a whole lot of Latin police officers now. And even the ones who aren't Latin are pretty much required to be bilingual. And often you get to the scene, everybody is speaking Spanish. And if we have a lot of people from El Salvador and uh, Nicaraguans, and it, it's a really multi-ethnic city, and it's, it's very exotic, to say the least. Did you speak Spanish when you arrived, first arrived in town? No, I didn't. And I still don't. You don't, always, speak, you don't speak any Spanish? No. I took lessons at one point. The Herald was giving them to the reporters. and uh, But it's really tough unless you have someone to bounce it off all the time. And I found, and I was working too many hours, I could never make it to the lessons because I was always out covering a story, plus the fact that, like, the lessons teach you to say, like, something like the dog is brown, and that doesn't do you any good when you get to the scene and everybody is screaming and hysterical and there's just been a mass shooting and people are, in, in, you know, babbling in, in rapid-fire Spanish. I mean, I wouldn't trust my own 
faulty Spanish anyway. So what I usually do is find a kid, because all the kids are bilingual. I find a kid about 11 or 12 or 13 uh, to interpret for me. And usually they're pretty accurate and pretty reliable, and they're, they're good. They're all bilingual. Mm, that's a great idea. Does, does not, is there no pressure on you? To, I mean, either from outside or from within, say, oh, someday, yeah, I've got to take a yeah, few months off. It's one of the things I would, I would love to do. But one of my fellow reporters uh, took this immersion course th mm -hmm. that the Herald was giving where you had to go and just speak nothing but Spanish at all, and mm -hmm. you couldn't go to the bathroom if you didn't know how to ask for it in Spanish. <laughs> you couldn't get anything to eat until you learned how to order it and ask for it in Spanish. It's this real high-pressure thing that she just had a splitting headache every night. But sure enough, three or four months later, she didn't know any of it anymore mm -hmm. anyway, because you have to use it every day. You have to listen to Spanish-language radio. You have to listen to Spanish-language TV. You have to really have someone you can use it on every day. And so most Anglo reporters aren't in that situation. Unless they have a Spanish-speaking roommate they can talk to in, in Spanish all the time. So I find it's usually better to do it in your own language and find someone to interpret for you. I really love fiction, and I'm really blessed because it's the first, you know, it's what I wanted to do when I was four years old. I told people I would be a writer when I grew up, and I intended it for it to be fiction. You know, journalism was an accident that I sort of happily fell into. And I'm finally getting to do what I wanted to do ever since I was a little kid. And not many of us get that chance. If so, there'd be a lot more cowboys and Indians and, and you know, policemen and firemen, so I, I'm pretty lucky. Edna Buchanan is 85 now and still lives in Florida. Now, you can get your copy of Never Let Them See You Cry by Edna Buchanan by tapping the link in our show notes or by going to our website, heardeverything.com. We may earn an Amazon commission if you make a purchase. HeardEverything.com is where you can also hear my 1990 interview with one of the masters of crime fiction, Elmore Leonard. For so many years, I took in writing. I wrote anything anyone asked me to write for money. I've written everything but cocktail napkins. Now, <laughs> I don't have to. Now I can write whatever I want. And my 2010 conversation with former FBI profiler Pat Brown. If you behave in a squirrely manner and you become a person of interest to a profiler, to a detective, well, maybe you should change your behavior. Nobody's saying you did it, but you sure look like you could have done it. And as you know, we post new episodes of Now I've Heard Everything every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you can find us everywhere you listen to podcasts. And thank you so much for listening. Next time on Now I've Heard Everything, as we approach the anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, we'll revisit my 2001 conversation with the man who basically invented what we now know as mission control, NASA's Chris Kraft. They were instant heroes and instant attraction to the press, and everybody in this country and, in fact, everybody in the world wanted to interview them, and if they couldn't get them, then they wanted to interview us. That's next time on Now I've Heard Everything. I'm Bill Thompson.